Hi there everybody, my name is Nikki. I've recently returned home from the Divine Truth Volunteer Training Program. And what I did whilst I was out there was I basically recorded as much footage as I possibly could in the hope to create a educational and also documentary style video. I also wanted to create an opportunity for people who were not part of this initial uh, training program an insight into everything that we did and you know what training we all took part in just so that just so that if in the future anybody uh, has an interest in doing such a such a thing themselves they they know of everything involved and uh, give everyone a little bit of idea of what to expect i sincerely feel from the bottom of my heart that all the information that i've managed to uh, get footage of will greatly help not just ourselves but everything on earth if the principles that Jesus and Mary teach and the principles that are um, outlined in this video are put into practice on a much larger scale. I just love this information so much and I just want to get it out there and share it with whoever is interested. The teachings of divine truth that are taught by Jesus and Mary Magdalene can basically impact upon all areas of our lives and so you know, what I wanted to do is basically give that perspective as well to everybody at home. You know, it's this video um, could be for people who have been listening to Divine Truth for a while, but also this video I feel would be beneficial to people who've never heard Divine Truth before. And just to see the types of um, ideas and projects that are currently going on. And, you know, whether you believe in God or not, at the moment it doesn't matter but what's most important is I feel that the stuff that we were trained in and the things that we saw whilst we were out there I feel would have a huge impact on so much of the world um, if the actual principles were put into practice and experimentation was done. I recorded all of this footage on my own video and sound equipment and I'd like to just quickly thank Jesus and Mary as well as everybody else who does appear in this video just for allowing me to get my camera out at all different type times of the day and through different periods just so that I could basically capture as much footage as possible. You may hear at different points throughout the video uh, reference to a number of different websites. What I'm going to do is actually put those websites down in the comments box below this video if you like to read up and visit those websites. I'd also like to make everybody aware that this was the first Divine Truth training program. And so some of the organ organizing and some of the schedule that you hear in this video may differ the next time this program is offered to people. Uh, we were invited to Jesus and Mary Magdalene's uh, Divine Truth studio to take part in an induction meeting. The main purpose of the meeting was for Jesus and Mary and any of the other people who helped organize the program to basically give us an overview of uh, what was going to be coming up throughout the program and giving us a heads up on different things to expect. The key thing is to remember these guys are here to learn about, to get skills in yeah. sharing divine truth with the world. But Jesus and I talked about it, and we think it's great for the three of you if the Learning Centre is your base while you're here. Yeah. And then if anyone else wants to invite you or you feel like you'd like to go and stay with just other ask. people, just ask. Um, it's a great way to get different experience and get to know other people, but it's good if you guys have your own base and yeah. you know, yeah. you're kind of settled there and you can have your own time for thinking and, and so on so yeah. after this coming week we thought all three of you could kind of be based down there yeah, yeah. Mm. Sounds good. yeah i've done my best emotional work alone you know that's always the case so uh, having the opportunity to be alone is always a good thing take the opportunity to read to, to just do things that you would not normally do at home you know, normally at home I know you'll be yourself. There's a lot of computer work basically and a lot of time on the computer. Yeah. You take the opportunity while you're here to spend less time and then and more time interacting with people. So you'll be here two days a week okay. initially. So you got you know, you can use the net here to contact people or yeah. or um, phone phone, phone. Uh, use our phone, that's fine. 
And oh, before you go ahead and get prepaid and stuff, remember that you've got the opportunity to actually be off the grid down there. Mm. And that's... Yeah, that's, I'm that's, to that. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. all the usual distractions are, you know, limited. It gives you, you a chance to feel stuff that yep. you haven't felt before, you know. Um, so sometimes you'll find that's good. Mm-hmm. And then in the second, the, in the in the January, you've, you're here three days of the week because we're actually going to start shooting a few days yeah. just so that you get some idea of how to run the switcher and stuff, yeah, stuff like that. You'll all get feedback while you're here. Mm. Yeah. That's okay. A lot of your learning that you've been doing with Lena and Igor, they'll just give you a task to do and you've just got to go off and do it. Okay. <laughs> and they won't be... They'll guide you a bit, but they're not going to spend, particularly in, Jan, in, in December, they won't be spending a lot yeah. of time with you. But they will be giving you things to do and things to uh, watch uh, as well. And One thing we'd like to try, wanted to try to do too, um, but probably won't have the time, is to start helping you guys understand what it's like to actually make a garden for yourself and, mm. you, know, yeah, like you know, those yeah, kind of things because they are things that you've probably never done in your life. And, yeah. and, and it would just be chance. good for you guys yeah. to see the we're prep involved and stuff like that and, yeah. and understand why, you know, understand things better because you, at the moment you're consuming a lot without understanding where it's all coming from. Really. Mm. So that's another thing we'd like to talk to you about is how you handle waste. Yeah. Yeah. And, we we make uh, we try to minimise the amount of plastic waste we have, um, and pretty much everything else, cardboard and and food scraps, all go into some kind of system. Mm. Um, and it would be great if down at the centre, you, um, you guys wow. could educate you, know, you guys. You know, if you if, if you how could, to do that in how to actually start up your own sort of worm farm system and. You can do it in the ground easy enough. It's just a matter of digging a hole in the ground and starting to put scraps on it and put stuff over the top of it. Um, and the beauty of doing it is that then we're not putting a we're putting a whole lot of goodness back into the ground rather than actually just dumping it. Mm. And, uh, and in the end, you reduce your waste footprint by a significant amount. You know, like mm. for myself and Mary, under normal circumstances, if we're not buying new equipment or anything. It, it, sometimes we, we go to the bin, our bin gets empty once every three months. Mm, yeah. right, so, and it's all just plastic or stuff that, you know, that we've accumulated through transportation and freight and stuff like that. Generally. All the other stuff, the, the, uh, all the cardboard and everything, we strip all the cardboard, which is plastic from the plastic and tape and everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we, uh, we, we put it in the ground again, you know, mm-hmm. and it's... And we've got a few worm t- farms going, so I'll show you those. Yeah. And we may also involve you in some outdoor programs as well, mm-hmm. um, both you and Courtney at some point, yeah. just to give you a bit of exposure there as well. Because yeah. um, you can learn a lot through that process, you know, mm-hmm. that you wouldn't normally learn otherwise. And, and these are things, you know, if you guys are interested later on in being near a centre or being mm-hmm. starting up centres, there's a whole lot of eco environment based systems that you're going to need to understand well. Yeah. So this week the guys, Lena and Igor, didn't show you like how to set up studio with cameras and ready for us to shoot. As part of the induction program, there was a customary uh, safety briefing. Um, we have well the ten most poisonous snakes in the world, so obviously. Pretty much every snake you're going to see is deadly. Is going to be deadly, aside from green tree snakes, which uh, which you might see. Mm, a couple. And we also have here. Yeah. I don't know down in the centre. You probably see a few down the centre as well. We have some pythons as well. <laughs> so the key is when you're walking outside, yeah. uh, watch what watch you know, watch the ground. Mm. Bit, you know, don't yeah. don't uh, sort of yeah. get involved talking too much and forget to look at your feet, particularly if you're going to wear shorts. Yes. Yeah. If you're going to, usually when we're working on the property in summer, yeah. I, I usually still wear jeans. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. To provide some protection. Yeah, just yeah. if the snake yeah. gets you, then it has to go through the through. jeans. Your, your gum boots will provide a bit of protection. Yeah. 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 So if you're doing work at the centre or if you're going for a big long walk on the centre, you're better to have long pants on. Yeah, or if you're going to go for a walk on the tracks, that's probably fine, mm-hmm. but yeah. watch mm-hmm. the ground a bit, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One of the best things is to wear pantyhose. Apparently, oh. they can't go through the pantyhose. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. What are pantyhose in Australia? Stockings. Stockings. 
Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, 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 I need to go to Woolies and get some. I was going to get that camera out of you guys were I don't know if Catherine's suggestion is that practical for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's also pretty hot. <laughs> so if you do get bitten though, do you know what to do? Not really. It's a compression yes. bandage. So, yeah. so if you've got bitten here, and, mm. yeah, you want to start down and wind down. Yeah, so you, you can press from the top. Yeah, pushing the pushing blood the blood down, down out to the uh, extremity. Uh, yeah, because so, you don't want uh, to bend. Of course, it's a bit hard if you've been in the stomach or something. And emo like, be very still. Yeah. You want to be quite Breathe. immobile. Mm -hmm. Um, but obviously, if you're walking by yourself, so it's not a good idea to walk by yourself, probably, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. your first. Yeah. We do all the time, of course, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're not accustomed to that. Yeah, you're not sort of accustomed to looking down. No, no. So it's probably not a good idea to walk by yourself if you go walking. The, the boys have noticed that I always look at where my hands are and, and under things before, yeah. before we do things. Yeah, yeah I don't do that. Yeah, yeah. you've got to be a bit more aware, that's all. Yeah. If you do that, you, you won't get bitten at all. But if you do get bitten, then obviously the key is for the person who's bitten to, you, you know, you wrap your compression bandage. So if the bite was there, you wrap the compression mm -hmm. bandage, you're starting to hear wrap it tight going down and looser as you go down. Mm. Keeps the blood mm -hmm. flow down there. And then you want to stay quite still until you get to hospital to have an antivenom. Mm. But they're very, very shy. Yeah. Unlikely, you know, to get bitten by them unless you're really mm. doing some silly things like putting stuff on you without checking it first and all that kind of stuff. And the other one is a, is a tiger snake. That can, can be quite aggressive. I've had one when I was a child chase me for nearly 100 metres. Whoa. Um, and they're fast too. And they're quite quick, yeah. So <laughs> I was running and it's really close to keeping up to me. So. But if you do but have a kidding. broad brimmed hat and you find yourself in some kind of situation like that, you can throw the hat onto the thing. Mm. Onto the onto snake. snake and yeah. run and just onto him because he, you know, yeah, it's not stop him. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Slow him down a bit. Yeah. Just take care when you're, uh, you know, <laughs> moving things around yeah. outside. Yeah. Two minutes. Moving things around outside. <laughs> yeah, you're basically just you finish, have a conversation, <laughs> then maybe a phone call. Mm. See you in like 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> See you in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the main reason why I wanted to see you guys before we saw everyone else today because it's just there's some things that everybody else really knows what to do and you yeah. guys don't know what to do yet so yeah. we wanted to cover that. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. I appreciate the chat, bro. Yeah. yeah. Have, a, have a good. Have a good. Six or seven weeks. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to the Learning Centre in Australia, Queensland. This is the main entrance up here, you can see, come on up. So this is where you can sit down if you're not scared of spiders. <laughs> they like to nestle themselves in there, but they're not deadly ones, just regular house spiders. We basically have a, a show of nature every day. All the kangaroos and wallabies and stuff all run across here. And they go over there and they eat some of the scraps that we set up for the tree. Still see they have some cardo there that we have to put up. This is the bicycle that the cameraman, Nikki uses to go on his rides and expeditions with type hands. This is the connector between the two locations. So we have two bedrooms here. We can show you very simple, very basic. One bedroom. Just literally a bed. That's the <laughs> definition, bedroom. Bedroom number two, which Nikki's using. A little bit neater and stuff. As you can tell, it's a little bit. And what we're going to do now is continue the walk around and then we'll take you to the living room. We have storage there and storage on both sides. I think this is the first, no, first aid's in the pantry. So boots and a few different things in here. We just have a tent in here. Back here, we just did our washing. So you can see uh, we got everything up on the line. Underwears and all. This is uh, going to be the washing room and bath or shower area. Um, we should be having a washing machine installed on Tuesday. At the moment it's just Nikki and I, but we'll be joined by Courtney shortly. Uh, so there'll be three of us in case two people want to shower at the same time. Pretty cool. You can see that we also have 5,000 gallon tanks with the same runoff system that you may have seen in other videos. The same first flush system set up. It's pretty cool. This is the main bathroom here. It's actually designed really well. Um, 
The finishes on it are actually really nice. Mm. We have, yep, a, sh a shower and a tub. So you can really take your pick on what you want. And all the designs are pretty new. All the different things that we need here. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to notice that pretty much all the corners have these 5,000 gallon drums. Um, over here at the front, there's two. So in total, there's four or 5,000 gallon drums, which is a significant amount. <clears throat> this is where we're going to be doing some of the planting. Um, it's all pretty rough right now, and we're going to just give it some love and try and bring it back. There are some to help. At the moment, the kangaroos just kind of get in there, the wallabies, and just eat the little things. And this is the main living area. I have some storage here. Uh, I'm sleeping right here, literally. Um, and we have everything here. You can see this is all mesh, so there's actually no glass here. So you can really hear all the sounds outside, and there's a lot of unique sounds in Australia. They have birds that sound like monkeys. The, the kangaroos are making weird noises. The koalas sound like angry bears. Um, there's just a lot of stuff out there. And when you sit down here, and Nikki and I are talking at night or something and reflecting, we can just see all the animals out there, which is really actually kind of cool. I'll miss that. Uh, really nice open plan kitchen. So that's pretty cool. All the areas, we have two different sinks in case two different people are doing things in the kitchen. It's not cramped, so you're not really feeling like you're all squished up. Um, there's a nice chimney here with a fireplace for winter. It gets pretty cold here. I think it gets to, I think Trish said it gets to about one or two degrees. And uh, yep, yeah, there's the fridge and the pantry over here. This is where Nikki's keeping some of his goodies and treats. And here you see the inverter, charger, and the solar controller, and uh, basically everything that runs the electrical part of the house. Um, we're completely off the grid, so we're literally catching the sunlight and using that to power everything, and we're literally catching the rainwater and using that to drink and bathe and shower. So it's pretty cool, pretty self-sufficient. Long hallway that we can walk down. The last part you haven't seen. It's pretty peaceful out here as you can listen. There's really nothing. Just the animals and us. Pretty remote location. It's really nice. At first, uh, Nikki and I were a little bit intimidated because they have a lot of very dangerous animals. So that's Jay's truck. He's been kind enough to gift that to us while we're here. Uh, welcome to the Learning Center. We've had a bit of an ordeal today trying to get cold water, actually. <laughs> I wish, yeah, he, he was saying he wished he recorded that. It's yeah. Pretty funny, actually. Yeah. The struggle is yeah. real, real out here. Yeah, we, we I've about. never appreciated cold water as much. <laughs> yeah, right? Like ice. Yeah. yeah. It, it gets cooler, like, maybe, like, at 10 p.m., 11 a.m. Yeah. It might get down to, like, 15, 16 degrees, so then it starts to really get cool. Cool. But in the daytime... Ooh. You feel like a lion in the Serengeti. Yeah. <laughs> you're, just, you're just laying there, like, <laughs> flies everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we're getting kind of tired of having to slurp on hot water, as you probably saw in uh, the, the video log earlier. So we're thinking, like, why are we struggling, right? We could come up with some shit that we can do to not. So this container's in here, right? This is a good amount of water. So I'm just going to put this in the fridge. Problem solved. Well, we'll see if problem solved. <laughs> Maybe we'll get cold water tomorrow. <laughs> it's pretty cool that we're here. Yeah. And we're the first ones just yeah. being like the guinea pigs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so we write down things that we see that maybe could help with the essentials for the next people that come. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's really cool, like he said, to see it at the beginning. A big part of the volunteer program was the studio training. Lena and Igor kindly offered to train us volunteers up in the technical aspects of sharing divine truth. These things included uh, hardware such as putting the camera uh, set up together, as well as understanding and learning about the software involved in cutting videos up, editing videos, and also editing sound. Jesus also gave a number of uh, training presentations to us volunteers to help us understand the theory behind sound editing as well as giving a number of practical demonstrations of the different nuances to the sound software. So what we'd like to do is for each one of you uh, you can make notes of the procedure itself 
independently from each other. Um, step by step, how you think it's logical, describe the process so a new person, for example, would read the process without having anyone else telling them and they would be able to do what you guys are doing. Okay. Mm. Then at the end, what we'll do is we'll get you to sit down and discuss your own list with each other, figure out the differences and why there are, fill in the details, which, you know, if someone might have more details, less details and so forth, and compile a single document, which we then will review and see if it's logical, makes sense, nothing's mm -hmm. been missed, yeah. and so forth. The reason for this is it's part of the principles of allowing the next person after you. Which is when you, when you document your procedure once, you know, yeah. you can give it to a person next time. Or even if you forget, and two months later, you can go, okay. Guaranteed you will forget. Trust me, we've done this hundreds of times, maybe more, maybe 300 times. And if we don't do it for a year, and the equipment is sitting in the boxes rather than being set up so we can see how it's been done, and we've got to pull it out of the boxes, it's a struggle to remember. What you think you know, if you don't do it for a year or so, you will forget with technology, that's how it is. Software, deal with software and so forth, you forget. Uh, type them up, yep. your notes, in a plain text, not the word or anything like that, nothing fancy. Just a text editor. So do it in our journals for now and then type yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, and, then, and then at the end, you just collaborate, so a yeah. bit of a teamwork. Yeah. yeah. You assign a leader, you're <laughs> gonna type up the final correction. Yeah and yes. you come up with a document. So it's a, it's like a, a mini procedure project. in itself, mini cool. yeah. interaction, loving, you know. Yeah. yeah. Cool. There's a big focus throughout the duration of the volunteer training program on eco projects. Luckily, uh, we got shown a number of varying projects that were being undertaken. Okay, my name's Pete Litton Hitchens and I'm here with Nikki and Dave. Um, we just got all the scraps out of our local supermarket, which is a Woolworths and a local veggie, fruit and veggie shop. So what they do twice a week, um, we go into town, collect all the scraps. They have bins and buckets, which you've just seen. They put them in there and we bring them out here. So what the goal for us out here is, what we wanted to do is we're wanting to create soil we also wanting to bring a lot of um, life back into the soil. The soil is very hard and very dry. We wanted to get all the microbes and bacteria and fungi and all those guys develop. And you can see in here too, there's a lot of moisture and a lot of juice in here, which is just really good too, because that helps the whole breakdown process. So we want to just create this massive food factory for all the little microbes and bacteria and fungi and earthworms. So they can have a feed, they can break it all down and then what we get left with is just really amazing soil. So we wanted to reboot the soil. As you look around the landscape with Nikki's camera, you can see it's quite rocky, it's quite hard, it's really compact. So there's no springiness in the soil and there's mm -hmm. not a lot of opportunity for the, for the life to live in that soil the way it is. So this area used to be, you know, a, a few hundred years ago, a dry land rainforest. So all the big trees have been taken out of it all the organic matter has been taken out of it. So you can see we want to create the soil. And then what we got this in the background, you can see we got this, this here is a local native plant called Debosia, which they, um, they chip and get all the um, oils and all out of it for pharmaceuticals. So it's not a hardwood, it's a softwood. Mm -hmm. And generally when you're talking about softwoods, they break down quite quickly. Mm. So what's really cool about this stuff is it breaks down, but in the process of breaking down, it creates all these opportunities for fungus and microbes and bacteria. And that's just essential if we're wanting to, to reboot the life here. So when you're wanting to create a healthy system, um, we just got to bring a lot of inputs in to reboot it. Once it gets rebooted, it can look after itself. But until that takes place, it has a hard time. The other thing you'll notice here, we're on a bank. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a a natural moisture storage so that when we get lots of rain we can actually hold the moisture in here so with these scraps if you can be putting them in either trenches or in swales or on contour lines and things like that it works a lot more effectively in the fact that 
um, after it all breaks down, you've got this natural moisture sink, which then, if you want to plant your fruit and veg or you want to plant some native trees in, you've just got this really beautiful moist place that um, is really essential for growing cool stuff. You look in there. You put your hand in there and you can feel the heat. You can. That's starting to do. Yeah, I'll just go in a new spot. See, there are all the veggies in there. You see. Whoa. And you can you put your hand here, Dave. So that's composting. When it's when you got heat, you got composting. Oh yeah, it is. Oh uh, yeah. So so the only time you want to do composting. Oh, look, you can still see some of the old scraps. Yeah, yeah. It's all in there. It's all mm. mush mush. See all that mush mush? Yeah. That's all. And if you look at that, see how so that's fungus that's just made made this, which is really hard. Soft. And then it's just turned it like that. Oh, beautiful. Mm. So this is already starting the process. That's starting side. the process. Mm. And so there's, you, there's a difference between composting and slowly breaking things down. Mm. And um, you only want to compost when you're making soil. Because right. otherwise you're better to do a slow, a slow breakdown because if you have heat, you don't get mm. all the life in the heat. So mm. up in here is where all the little creatures are going to live because it's not too hot for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas as soon as you get real hot in there, pretty hot, doesn't it? Yeah, it's pretty hot down there, and the little guys are not going to be able to live down there. So that's composting down there. Mm -hmm. Whereas up in here, that's just slow decomp decomposition. Yeah, you know, it's just slowly breaking down. This is cool. Like when you see <laughs> see life just starting all over again. Like fungus is just an extraordinary thing. If you ever want to have a forest again, you need fungus. Uh, but that's just quite, I, I see that. I just think that's a piece of magic. My, yeah. Life. Yeah. How did it even get there in the first place? You know, like, it's just, I can't ever really even comprehend how, yeah, you know, this little dude was just waiting for the right opportunity to do, yeah. do their magic. Yeah. And as you can see, if we left that exposed like that, mm -hmm. All the flies and everything wants to come in. Like nature's mm -hmm. all about just trying to break it back and recycle it. But by putting a, a covering of debosia or some sort of mulch over the top, what mm -hmm. it means is we can keep all the moisture in there and we can look after all that moisture without all the evaporation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that just means the cycle mm -hmm. is so much more effective. Yeah, this makes all the difference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool, guys. And you also put hay on it as well. Yep. When he didn't have the debosia, he put hay on it. He put card on it. Whatever organic matter you've got, it doesn't really matter what it is. If you're at home and you've got a little little pot, you, like you've got all your scraps out of your house, all you need to do is just dig a little hole, about this high, dig a little hole, mm -hmm. and you just put all your, your garden scraps over it, and then just a bit of cardboard. If you get the newspaper, just sprinkle that over the top of it each day and yep. just keep layering it up. And then you've got a beautiful... Simple. Mm -hmm. So like simple. going back into the earth. And so in your household, if you separate all your newspaper out of your plastics, then whenever you're doing your composting, you can even just shred up your newspaper and whatever, mm. and then your earthworms will love it. But if you leave it like all compact, imagine you're an earthworm, it's like, oh, I'm going to work my way through that. Whereas if it's all shredded, it's just easy for mm. them to, to break down. I always think when we're doing these sort of things, you got to start thinking as if you're an earthworm or one of these guys. Like, And if you do that, then you're like, man, let's try and make it easy for them yeah. rather than make it hard for them. Yeah. So it's like if you're having to live in, you know, a, a drowning in water, you're not going to do very well. Whereas if you've got an area where you can, if you're a worm and you can move up through the layers, so say you get lots of rain, you want to have it that they can move up and down through the layers. So here, um, if we suddenly got masses of amount of rain, all the little creatures can just move up towards the surface and they're not getting drowned. Yeah. Mm. So mm. if you're building things like trenches, you want to think about that. So. If suddenly you get masses of rain, you don't want to drown everything in there. You want to have it that the little guys can move to drier ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dave, how did you find driving? Uh, I found it really good. He was really good at teaching and he was, and I prefer a teacher that's more like hands-on, like rather than tell me right is down and left is up, he was just pushed it right, pushed it left so I could <laughs> see it. So it was good um, and fun, yeah. lots of fun. I really enjoy that. The cool thing about loaders and stuff like that, it, it's not actually what you're doing. You're having to think about what, where you're going and what you're doing. So to be really efficient, you're already looking at your next job all the time. You're looking, always looking at how you can make it, make the loader work the best it can. And there's yeah. a lot of like things going on. You got the gas, you got the brakes, you got the up and down, you got the 
the tip and like yeah there's it's generally just, four or five things going on. Yeah. The <laughs> dust is the main one with Deboja. It's a really light product, so it does blow. And it's really the first six months. Once it's started to break down, there's not the dust, but some of this Deboja is quite fresh. And you can see the darker stuff to the lighter stuff. So the light stuff is the fresh stuff. And so it's still got a lot of that um, leafy dust in it. And, and what happens is if you get it in your eyes, your, um, your pupil dilates and you, you look like you're got massive huge eyes like literally he had it happen to him the other day and he just had like big pupils <laughs> and it doesn't take much to do it oh, yeah it's so it's just been really always look, working out where the wind is and how about if you breathe it in uh you get drunk you literally it feels as if you're drunk and it sticks to the back of your throat it goes in your nose and they also now are using it in surgery so anyone who goes into intensive surgery now there's some oh, yeah. sort of debosia Anesthetic. anesthetics yeah. and stuff like that so it's getting there's all sorts of different things they're like using it and finding it. And you useful. guys are the main producers of it for the world. Yeah, well, it's a local plant to this area. Um, what we're excited about is we get all the waste. <laughs> yeah. And that is just awesome. Yeah, isn't that crazy that the waste of the Debosier plant, the part that they don't even market, is actually amazing for gardening? But what's exciting is in the process, you create all this life as well, which then we have the fattest, biggest goannas that live around here. All the birds love it because there's all the bugs and creatures that are all in there. You don't have to dig very far down there and you find all these, all these little creatures living in it. Mm. So it just creates this massive food factory. All the willy wagtails, all the little birds, they all go in there. Mm -hmm. At night time, they just have a feast in here. Yeah. It's very important for us all to find ways in which we can harvest rainwater to use as drinking water and other things. As this is the case, a number of things have to be considered to basically catch the water and help clean it out so that we can then drink it. In the following clip, Cornelius explains to us the first flush system, which is extremely important in basically purifying the rainwater so that it is drinkable. Rain came down there and went down this first flush pipe. It's got the ball inside of it. We'll have a look at where the ball is. What happens if the pipe starting to do this bit? When it slowly, when the rain stops, it slowly just drains back down all the water that's in there and comes through this little 12 mil tube. Instead of just draining the water on the ground, you have pipe this to go back out into that water trench. So there's no water around the building then. A few parts to it. That's the filter. That's the ball that floats up and down. You can catch a bit of muck, as you can see off there. Let's that. They get cleaned out, we won't clean them this time, but just have a look. Actually, look at this muck. Look at that. Ooh. Yeah, you don't want that in your water. Yeah, you don't want that in the glass of water, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Put that back up in there. Wash my hand. That's it, we'll filter it. Just put that quick wash out there. You just use an old toothbrush and just wash it. It goes back up in there. It's got this little, um, this little rubber thing, I don't know if you can see a hole through there, a little teeny weeny hole, it just slowly lets the water dribble out. That hole depends on if you get a bigger hole, we'll just drain this thing out quicker. We don't get a lot of rain, so we probably want to keep it up there. It's only been light rain, it takes a while to fill this thing up. Mm -hmm. It's heavy rain, it'll up really quickly. There's your first flush system. I had the opportunity to catch up with the three current directors of God's Way of Love organisation. And I took this opportunity to ask each of them a number of questions. My name's Eloisa Lytton Hitchens and I'm currently a director of God's Way LTD. The volunteer program or the volunteer induction program is a program to find people who have a desire to serve and share God's truth with the world. Um, we need volunteers for um, God's Way LTD and all the projects that we want to run for that and also Divine Truth needs volunteers to help run um, a lot of the workings and uh, jobs to free up uh, Jesus and Mary's time so that they can spend a lot more time presenting and um, gifting their invaluable material to the world. Is It's an opportunity for education um, to learn a lot about where you're at um, emotionally and the issues in yourself that are preventing you from uh, maybe having a more heartfelt desire to serve. Um, they're also an opportunity to learn about a whole lot of skills that you might not have. Um, or, and it's also an opportunity to find out about where you have certain skills, 
and where you don't have certain skills. And though you may have skills, you, your attitude may need to be developed in regards to love and truth. And if you develop, um, a lot of it's about your attitude and finding out where you're at and where we need to develop. Um, though I will be helping to run this program, I also feel like I'm a volunteer in an induction program myself. And so there's a lot of things to learn and to grow and understand. But I'm really excited about the program and I feel that anyone who engages the program will find it um, exceptionally beneficial actually. The program is also to understand every part of the workings um, that, that go into divine truth and, and um, sharing God's truth with the world and also um, into the God's Way project or projects. So it's about understanding how to do all parts of it. You may not be an expert in all parts of it, but you'll come to understand how everything runs so that if you're a member of the team and you become a permanent volunteer, you will be able to do any job at any time. Um, so that everyone becomes a seamless working team. It's learning about how to do those so that there's economy and function and the basic principles um, of God's truth. Uh, my name is Tristan Miller and my position, uh, I'm currently a director of God's Way Organization Limited. So the way it's uh, structured through the constitution is uh, firstly we have uh, the founding members, which is Jesus and Mary. They basically veto some of the big decisions and whether or not the, the people underneath are actually being loving or not. Uh, underneath are the members, uh, people who are, are part of the organization. Underneath that are the probation, patient, probationary members. Uh, they're those that we are, um, we're looking at to be members in the, in the long run and uh, to see if they can uphold some of the principles of, of the God's way. And then underneath that, we have volunteers and, uh, and employees, people who are just, just there for a, for a short amount of time to provide some of their, um, to donate some of their time and energy or resources. Part of that though is uh, there are some members who are called directors, like ourselves, who make decisions about how the organization is actually run and actually make decisions about some of the big, uh, big pro the projects we're going to start and and some of the properties that, that, that we'll buy. Directors I, I, I need to have a feeling of um, that they want to have a relationship with God and that they want to actually find out what God's way is and learn that through their relationship with God. Um, we wholeheartedly feel that uh, and, and, and know through our own experience that, that people can actually get close to, get close to God by, um, by desiring a relationship with anybody. Can. Um, and we want to prove that you can actually find out God's way. And so uh, those who, who work on God's way are all having that kind of commitment. And those who are the most committed will be directors making those decisions based on God's way. And saying that, the founding members in the long run will be the ones to actually determine at the moment whether or not we actually are hitting that mark. Um, but we're hoping to be able to do that without, without the need for their, for their help to do so in the long run. In our constitution, we actually have, uh, have written up of what happens if someone actually decides that they're they actually are not going to do things God's way and uh, and don't have any emotional responsibility of, of why they're doing that. So they're, either they, they want to be unloving to someone else or be unloving in their actions and they don't wish to change, um, then, uh, then they can be removed. Um, depending on where they are in the hierarchy, they might be removed by the directors ourselves or if, we are, if they are directors, they might be removed by the, by the founding members. Now, the founding members are pretty... Uh, pretty concise and, and committed to to being as loving as they can, so we, we don't see any issue there. My name is Catherine Spence, and I am a director of God's Way. Well, the size of the, the learning centre is a bit over 600 acres. Um, it's a little place called Kushni that it's at. Uh, the nearest biggest town is Kingaroy, and it's in Queensland. It is a... a a block of land uh, that was very run down and still is run down and we just want to repair the land yes and uh, try and get it back to the way God created it. Because our rainfall is different to a lot of the rainfall we usually only get our rainfall three months of the year so what we really want to do is retain all the rain that falls on the actual land itself and this is what we have to do. We've got to go ahead and do different um, environmental things such as um, 
digging uh, living systems or pits and things like that and filling them up with any sort of organic matter we can find and um, that will retain the water and hopefully or eventually it would be nice if they were all over the place and little bits would just soak out. It would be nice in so many years um, if it turned out like the bunyas and we had water actually running on the land all, uh, all the time. If we actually improve the environment, we will get all the animals that you can find. They'll, they'll all come and love being here. If we can have water on the place most of the year, we will find then that the grasses will grow and seed and um, the birds, all the little small birds will be coming. And... This year's going to be about planning, where, what we're going to do next and, and how, and, and then going ahead as soon as we think that the seed is something that's loving and we have the donations to do so. We feel that the closer we can get to God and our relationships with God, uh, the quicker we can actually make decisions uh, based on what God would want for us for the learning centre and in our projects. But at the moment, we uh, we are just learning and we we are growing that relationship. So we are going to do a lot of planning about how our actions might affect the whole learning centre, not just the portions that we might change. We might do a, few, a bit of building, uh, especially in relation to. Uh, the visitors center and we might create a bit of a hall and a place for a caretaker but these will be on places that already have been built on so that way we're not actually uh, hurting much of the environment uh, by doing so by changing things around we're going to be very careful about how we what we're doing and making sure that we're doing the best possible loving thing we can and if we notice that we're not we'll change it as quickly as possible what i what i'm hoping that will happen is that it will be an example of demonstrating in a practical way principles of God's truth on earth. Um, now, when I say that, if you haven't listened to any divine truth, you'll be like, well, what does that mean? Um, it's a, the Learning Centre, for instance, which is one of the projects that God's Way is undertaking, is going to be a centre for education. And when I talk about education, I mean every kind of education you can imagine. It's a place that we want to collate and collect resources um, where we want to do experiments and scientifically and validate those, keep that information so that people can come in from anywhere in the world, no matter who they are, they can come in and they have access to that information. So it's like a massive library of information. Um, so if you want to set up a school, if you want to set up um, some environmental projects, if you want to change the world's farming system, if you want to um, know about medical stuff, anything you can imagine. Eventually, we would like to have a whole library of information on that thing that is scientifically validated, understood, the mistakes are documented, as well as the successes. And so that anybody can come and say, oh, I really would love to do this, but I'm not sure how to make the changes. My personal passions are definitely in relation to education. I wholeheartedly feel that uh, the kids can be taught a lot differently, that we can teach them how to be leaders and not just workers. Uh, not just to take directions, but learn how to think about everyone around them and, and create their own instructions for what they're doing. We also want to teach kids how to actually be emotionally connected to themselves and be able to deal with emotionally charged situations. I feel that if we do this, then kids a lot earlier will have the abilities um, that we tend to only get in our 20s, where they can be able to look after their own lives and be leaders of their own fields much earlier on. Uh, that way they're not just surviving, but they're thriving. I really want to be able to like, create a great education system for the, for the whole world in the, in the coming years. So I'm discovering my passions. I feel like it's this ongoing discovery. So far, I have discovered that I feel pretty passionate about um, education, particularly with families and the adult aspect of the family. Um, I also feel passionate about children's education. I'm realising that the greatest impact can be made by um, parents or um, changing themselves. And so I'm getting more and more excited about creating some education programs for, adult, um, for parents, but also just as a general adult education program in love. When I hear it, I'm like, wow, I want to do that. I feel that there's a lot of potential for growth. And I feel that if um, adults or fam, and when I say adults, basically family units, if they made the change, 
then I feel that there's a lot of potential for change the whole world over. I feel quite passionate about the environment. We've done a lot of damage personally to the environment. I'm seeing how we can make some changes now that actually work and that actually do create change. Um, again, we need to document those, but I feel that if we could farm in a different way, um, if we could grow food in a different way, and, and not just farming and food for human consumption, but actually um, help to rehabilitate um, natural uh, vegetation and forests and watercourses. You know, we're on a path to destruction in that area, and if we don't do something and change it, um, it's not going to go well. You know, already there's a lot of um, damage that's done and we need to start some education processes to change that. So when I talk about farming, it's changing our current attitudes to farming and the way that we view land as our resource and something that we can continuously take from rather than realising that if we don't actually give back and replenish our soils, if we don't actually take more care of our environment, that it is not going to be able to be sustainable. Currently, there is so much being taken um, and not enough given back that, that the whole weather patterns are changing. And we need to become re-educated and actually um, find ways that enable the earth to be productive and enable the longevity of, of, of what it has done. And this is about discovering the way that God originally designed things to function. Um, if you look at an ecosystem, it runs perfectly without any human intervention whatsoever or to work more in harmony with these, um, with the principles that God has already designed and are in place in the environment, if we are actually going to have a world that, that we can still live on. Um, you know, the deserts are getting bigger and we need to figure out ways that we can actually create uh, soil in deserts and actually hold moisture in deserts. Um, now, there's a lot of issues with the way that we um, currently run agricultural farming. And if people chose to be vegan and live off a plant-based diet, that would solve a lot of problems in our world. But it is not the only thing um, to do with the environment that is a problem. You know, burning off, a huge problem. Um, the amount of clearing that we're doing, a huge problem, because it's taking out all of the little microbes and all of the intelligent life that actually helps to create our soils and our environments to work properly. And we don't really understand the way that things work a lot of the time. Um, we're just learning about some of the principles involved. And the more that I learn, the more I realize, wow, we're really out of harmony with, with the way that, um, that God created things to function. And the problem is, is that we think it's normal because each generation comes in and it's the way it is. And no one really knows what it was like 300 years ago. No one, no one understands or has a concept of how it used to be for real. We all think, oh, no, it always was like this. And that's a, a dangerous attitude because we, we then just keep, keep taking and keep taking and we don't see much change. And then the next generation arrives and they think, oh, this is normal. And there's even less. I'm very passionate about God and divine truth. And I'm very passionate about God's way in the learning center and um, I'm very interested in everything that's going to happen on the learning center but my real passion most of my life even from very early childhood I used to take myself walking in the bush by myself and it's where I saw tadpoles turn into frogs and all my experiments and that, well, I don't suppose they were experiments, they were observations. And so I suppose all of nature and um, environmental um, things, yeah. Yes, and as I've been on the land all my life, or just about all my life, um, or doing the wrong things, of course, such as uh, breeding animals and eating animals and... Um, all that sort of thing. It's about time I um, paid back for some of those things that I did. God's Way runs financially um, on donations and gifts. So God's Way won't accept or take out loans, um, and that's part of our constitution. Uh, we run on gifts and donations because that's the way that God's world works, um, or God's universe works. It's all about gifts. 
and we are wanting to be in harmony with the way God does things. And so we are experimenting with this ourselves. A gift can be both monetary or it can also be a material gift or it can even be um, waste. So currently there's some um, people giving us some gifts from the local community produce stores. So the property was financed by the generosity of a few people and any project that we run will be, um, basically we'll need to gather the finances before that project goes ahead. If we don't have the finances, we won't be doing the project. It's not a company set up for profit. It's about whatever income that we receive through donations and gifts. That is what we'll use to do our projects. But a gift is a gift. It's not something that can be refunded because we will use all that money in projects and we won't be able to refund it. Like once you've built the hall, you no longer have the money. Or once you've built the road, we're not going to be able to give those gifts back. And so it needs to be a sincere, heartfelt desire to give a gift. But if they're given with a demand and expectation um, for quid pro quo, wanting something in return, either emotionally or physically, um, that gift won't be able to be accepted. There's also um, our issues, say, in receiving money from um, dodgy practices or... Uh, illegal activities and that's something that we won't be able to take money from either because we want to maintain a certain level of ethics um, and morality and it would be unethical to receive money from um, say from taking money from and making others suffer or um, harming others in some way but we also rely upon gifts and donations in order to do the projects that we're aspiring to do but everything that the learning center in God's way does is also a gift um, so yeah, we're very interested to see how this system works and, um, and runs in practice. We also have our own personal blogs. So I have my own personal blog. It's more to do though about um, my personal growth from now to later on. So we're talking more about where we're at at the moment compared to how we might, how we might be in the future. Uh, and that's mine is the www.godsprincipleoftruth.com. Just could be talking a bit about some of my personal stuff about working with God's way but also about soulmate and, and my own personal progress within my relationship with God. So if you need to contact me personally for some reason, you can go there. We have a website, discoverylearningcenter.org, and that has all our contact details on it. Um, we will be changing our website in the new, near future, but if you go to that blog, it will be up and um, you can be redirected from there. You can also contact us at the following email address, which is consult at godswayoflove.org. So that's the best way to contact us via email. If you want to contact me personally for any reason, um, that's uh, peteraloisa.wordpress.com. Um, and yeah, happy to answer your questions, queries, or um, any other information you'd like to receive. If they wanted to volunteer, uh, there is a bit of an application process. Uh, we do like them to firstly think about whether or not they can fulfill uh, some of the requirements of volunteers, especially their commitment to serve. Um, a lot of people get into volunteer to try and get something out of it rather than to give. Um, the first way to, to contact us is usually through the consult at godsway.org. Uh, um, that's if you want to volunteer for God's Way. We will get in touch with you, talk you through some of the requirements. We will be asking you to do a volunteer induction program as a first step. And then there'll be training programs after that too. But the thing we care about the most is, do they have a commitment to doing things God's Way? Do they have a commitment to serving? And if they do, then if they're open to feedback, if they're open to growing, then we can work with them. Uh, however, even if we have people who are highly skilled, but have no commitment to serve, then we, we can't work with them in, in the long run. They're better off doing things in their own passions. But uh, if they do, they can definitely apply and there'll, there'll be a process. And we'd love to work with them because part of us going through these courses, uh, these induction courses and training courses, is actually teaching ourselves as well as them. And it is part of God's way to learn how to train other people. So, uh, so that will be part of even the, pro even the projects themselves. If, uh, if people are interested in, uh, in providing but don't wish to actually be a part of it, they just want to see how it goes, they can donate. Uh, there's a donations page uh, and they can donate either to personally to ourselves if they want to or they can donate straight to God's Way. Understanding that uh, if there's some big projects coming up and they want to directly donate to those projects, that's fine. However, we will be using their money in, in the way we feel is most loving, not the way that they might feel that they want their money to be used. Remember, if they donate, it's going to be a gift.
Cornelius extended the opportunity to the volunteers and also a number of other people to go on a two-part eco-learning experience. The first part was taking us all up to the Bunya Mountains and to go on a walk and look at all the ways in which God has created such an awesome rainforest and observing things and seeing how we could then apply the same principles in places where the environment needs recovering such as where the learning center is located as well as Corny's property itself. In part two we went for a tour around Cornelius's property and he showed us the varying projects he's got going on there to basically see if the principles that were observed up in the Bunya rainforest can be applied applied down at where he is living to help recover the environment. Today is discovering what the difference is between the two conditions, like what's got created here and how can I replicate that back down there to create this there. Mm -hmm. And there's certain laws and certain things going on here. It's just a matter of, just, that's why instead of just telling you what they are, it's a matter of coming up here and discovering them for yourself. Like I've had to come and do many times I come up here during winter time to see what the temperature's like and when, uh, summertime, like on really hot days, and, and seeing how water still runs even during droughts, is going, how does that happen? It just doesn't, I had to try and work out what was going on. Some of the things I thought were going on weren't happening here. So I had to try and work out what has God created. Just had to try and discover it. So I'm just going to leave a bit of that up to you to your eyes today. Just have a look, and see what happens, and then we'll go and discuss it later. See what you come up with. Yeah. Mm. Let's go for a walk. <laughs> but there's what those monsters like, and there's a few different types of lichen there, some little vine growing up it. What's lichen? It's like this, um, that stuff there. Oh, okay. It's like moss stuff, that's like a lichen, it's a different thing altogether. This is, this is another like style that. again. It's yeah. nice fluffy, it's fluffy, yeah, it's nice. There's a vine growing up there too. You've got some in a hole up there. Yeah, looks like that, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's just on like one tree at the very bottom it's just doing a whole stack of things all staghorns going up further there as well so it's hosting so many different forms of life already check out the buttresses on this tree there's your dinosaur <laughs> that's amazing I don't know what it is. is it you know, come back vines one that, that as you're walking through it grabs you and, <laughs> and suddenly brings you back. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone deep down loves this kind of stuff, don't they, really? Yeah. You can't not, can you? At the moment, they're growing in, in diversity, what they eat well, and how they cook it. Uh, yeah. But in the past, they used to be more than uh, yeah. so, Well, I want to cook it. And if the people are changing tree. and things like that, and I'm just wondering if a lot of that stuff in the field. was never here before I didn't, didn't plant anything but there's a, there was a seed in the ground there originally mm. so when this area was more rainforest in I was wondering why is this growing here like why is this seed kicked off that was when we had those heavy rains oh. and the water used to watch the water where it goes and it all runs down the driveway and comes down this patch mm. yeah. yeah so it gives you an indication that you need with water's in the system the seeds are already there all you got to create is the water there's lots of water coming down that road and it used to go down the valley and it used to be um, trying to stop the erosion going down the valley and I thought well, why don't I just stop it and catch it first and so yeah. I dug a contour line across 
I actually had a swale there originally and I dug it into the swale. I'm, like, I'm so excited by it. I caught so much water, that dug a bit more than I thought this is so awesome. Just dug another one. It's getting bigger and bigger so it can hold it on top of the hill. So it catches heaps of water there and it slowly sinks down over the next couple of days and slowly goes underground. Whereas before it was just running down the hill to a little sealed up dam that was doing not much down there. Yeah, you can see where the water's coming from. Yeah, whenever it used to rain really heavy too, you'd get straight out there with an umbrella even when it was just about finished. And just seeing where the, where the water was going to, like trying to work out where it's going to, to where to catch it. Because you've got to know where your source is, like and where's it coming from. Mm. So if you know what areas are really running fast, you know you can put something in there, like a good big swale or a pit or something like that. Or, or if you want to direct it from somewhere, you know where to cap it, get it from to go to somewhere. Yeah. yeah. That's mm. good just to get out while it's rained and just go and have a good look at it. Thing like cardboard is really good for absorbing moisture. This tip stuff is for free at the tip. Just mm. all green waste that's been composted down. There's like sawdust here from the um, mill as well. I went to get some garden stakes from a um, tree protectors. And when I was at the mill, the, there's this big pile of sawdust and it hadn't rained for a month and there's just all this water leaching out of it. I thought, oh, wow, that's pretty good. So I just got a trailer load for five bucks or something like that. It's been going forever. Yeah, so I thought that's going to add to my little system, my composting toilet system. I wanted to try and mm -hmm. put a few different things into it. It attracts more life rather than just one thing that will attract one thing, but I wanted to attract as many things as possible. Because the more life you're adding to the system, the more it can actually break down quicker and mm -hmm. actually add whatever their little job is. Whatever they put into the soil, it's going to add just another element to your soil as well. So the more life, the better. But you have to keep watering and watering mm -hmm. it. Yeah, it's almost it's running off. Yeah, it's like Teflon coated. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's just powdery. It's like repellent. Yeah. yeah. That is not very useful. Yeah, right no, there. Well, that's what I figured. I used to. I, it was really nice when it came from the tip because they composted it down. It was real moisty. You're thinking that's great for gardens and stuff. And then went to use it and thought, wow, as soon as it dries out, you have to pretty much rip your whole garden bed up to try and get it all wet again. What I'm doing is actually using this crappy stuff. It's pretty much, you call it good for nothing soil, just about, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Compost and using that in the composting system that I mm -hmm. make. And I, I wet it up and put it all in a wheelbarrow and with um, the grass here, grass clippings and the sawdust and get it all wet or just moist. Mm -hmm. And then I put it in um, some buckets and just keep it there. It's usually a month or something. And um, just so I don't have to make it all the time. And use that and it helps absorb the stuff in the poo stuff. But when it goes into the worm farm, it's already sort of moist as well. I don't even water it from that point. I just eat everything up. What I've noticed is even by, um, we'll go down there shortly and have a look, that just by putting um, multiple things in there, it's, had other, it's not just the worms in the worm farm now, it's all this other life that's come into it as well, which is an awesome sign. I and mean, when there's more than just one thing that you put in there, other life's attracted to it. Mm. So you're on the right path and mm. other life gets already attracted mm. to it. So you found a way to use this dry stuff to absorb. Yeah. I think it's that word, too moist. It was actually three parts of waste. It's like that waste from garden waste that was, you know, composted down but no good really. There's this green waste like grass clippings and then there's a sawdust from mill waste. All those three things together turn into super rich soil. That was what you were talking about that kept everything alive? Yeah, this stuff keeps everything alive. It looks as dead as dead. <laughs> but because you put life, it goes into the systems that the little animals that eat it all up and do what they gotta do to it, and it turns into something incredible. Like super super food. Is that the magic soil? That's been sitting there. That's just been sitting there for a month. Pretty much I've been in the bucket that I've had there and just tipped it in there. It's been sitting there, so it's just that's what it looks like with the grass and the sawdust and Mm -hmm. That's held moisture over that whole month as well. That goes into the when you clay a deposit <laughs> in the composting toilet. Feel free to add to the deposit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this really is like tree. a bank because when you lay a deposit, that grows interest and it comes out and it gives you quite reward. <laughs> oh, you mix the, the all the different soils with the human waste and then it creates this. Yeah, those three different things like the um that sort of mulchy sort of stuff first and then sort of, sort of. yeah sawdust and the um, grass they're all mixed together oh. and that mix you saw in the deposit bucket yeah <laughs> yeah that's what it is and then that goes through like over here there's some empty ones there there have been that's some heavy deposits there <laughs> <laughs> yeah. then they're going to go <laughs> into, they need to go into here now but i just got to make another one i've got to use that stuff up in there first to make a new one because this one's just too high it's getting too higher than the bathtub that one actually hasn't broken down yet because it's too high it's too hot you don't know, like letting the bathtubs get too high. This one's just been getting higher and higher and higher and higher because I haven't got on to making that garden I wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. Usually I've found in thought about, it takes about four days. When I, I put one of those buckets in the worm farm here, particularly in summertime, four days it's gone completely. 
Huh? Not, not a thing. Can't say a thing of anything. Are so there worms in there partying right now? Partying? <laughs> are there worms in there? Yeah. Yeah, it's really awesome because you can't, the forest creates this, but it just takes a lot longer. Yeah. Like mm. imagine if every human on earth, not saying this is the best system or anything like that, but if every human on earth dealt with their own human waste, mm. Uh, and what they could put back into the soil, how yeah. quickly the planet could change. It's funny, isn't it? Like flushing toilets are good in some way, but in the other way, you consider that like, you've got really good drinking water. Yeah. They're getting rid of thousands of litres of that per day. Yeah. And you're turning good water into an hour problem. It's yeah. polluted water. Mm -hmm. You've got to try and deal with the pollution. Yeah. Not to pollute something else. So it's almost like you just created a bigger problem. Which hey, before, how do you know if you what you're doing is right and correct? How, is it in harmony or not? And it's when it's cyclical. When it's self-maintaining, like I can eat the food, go and f it out, put it through the compost system, let the, um, everything else break it down even further into a, a substance that's called humus that you can go put back in the garden that actually holds water, retains water, retains minerals, and I don't have to water it hardly anymore. I'd like the garden up there, I'll show you later. I'm, I haven't watered it since last summer. And it's just beautiful and moist still. Mm. And there's ones in here that need watering constantly. And I just got sick of watering, so I had to try and develop a way, and this is the way in the end. I used to use this on the trees down the orchard, but I thought, why don't I just use it like up here too? Mm. So I thought it was like all oh, poo contaminated, <laughs> like everybody else, real without realizing how much the creatures clean it up, mm. what a really good job they do with it, and how it looks nothing. It's got no resemblance to poo or anything. It's just completely beautiful soil. I'm going buying bags of um, horse manure and stuff like that, and I, I add that in as well sometimes. It just adds a bit of extra stuff in there. But also, because this is like super rich, you don't just go and plant a whole pot of it. You usually put it into some other soil, because it's not actually a soil structure by itself. It's mm. something that scientists can't really... It's like a fertilizer. Yeah, in a way, it's not even a fertilizer too, but it has does react like a fertilizer. Mm. It's got so many things in it. That's because all the little creatures put so many things in it. In what way would you say it's different than a fertilizer? Um, fertilizers usually have like a certain thing, don't they? Like a nitrogen or potassium oh, okay. or things like that in it. Yeah. And they, just, they usually promote one certain thing in the plant, whereas this stuff just does it across the board. Got it. Because it's also a wetting agent too, because it holds so much more water in the in the, in the um, soil as well. But also, when it does rain, a lot of those, you have seen the huge problems we've had in the Barrier Reef with so much um, fertilizer mm. being washed off into streams. Mm. What this stuff does is actually locks them up, it holds them there, makes them stable to stay in the soil, so it doesn't actually wash them out. Mm -hmm. uh, humus, that's what the forest creates as well. Mm. Yeah, but just a slower process. Mm. Mm. How would you do it on an economy start scale with 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 a big yeah. um, you know with say there's twenty people living there or something like that? And, yeah, and um, you could still do that. You could still have a system where you still have the toilets, but someone's either you just choose yours. You can look after. You take responsibility yes. for it because this is about self responsibility in the end too. Yeah. Not re not yeah. requiring someone else to go and deal with your any yeah. of your day's product. But that's the only stumbling block I've come across is how, if it's the right system, how can I, because everything can be upscaled and downscaled with good mm. systems too. Mm. I still don't know how to upscale it. Also this tree here, right in front of us, this tall one here, that was pretty much dead about two years ago. It had mm. no leaves on it at all, it was a stick, something that's gone. Oh. So I put a heap of mulch around the bottom of it as well and that's, look how thick it's become now. Yeah. It's like twice as thick as it ever was. That's some green too. Yeah, it's also good too. So it's, the koalas are around more too because they like the good yummy leaves and they like the shoots and the, whenever there's new um if a tree's growing well I'll always have new shoots on the ends yeah nice and juicy ones mm. you see almost that tree there how it hasn't got any mulch around it same tree it doesn't really stick of growth on it mm -hmm. yeah that one there's pretty thick of growth too there's put a lot of stuff around that and it's got a lot of mulch up the hill of it as well mm. What I'm, trying, what I'm trying to do is, like up in the forest, you know how we have the trees have so much cover up top, and these trees up here are quite sparse, so these little yeah. like sort of come saffled mm. through. I want to try and attack it from both levels, like fix the ground up, like it's in cover on the ground, but I also want to make sure the trees grow really well up top, so there's lots of leaves, and have to like hit it from both angles. Another thing too, like when it rains too, all that flat area there where the tanks are, all the water comes off it, eventually drains this way, that's why I put the pineapples there, yeah, so the mozzle yeah, utilise growing something from it. They just like pineapples, you get the shops and just rip the tops off and <laughs> tuck them out here for wow. a day or two, get the wallabies to chew the bottoms off them <laughs> and just screw them into the ground really. I've also built it up to a point here, this side here, there's a couple of inches below the top there, so just in case this gets completely full, it'll back up and overflow back down to where it naturally goes, mm. so it won't stay, go over the top of here. 
destroy one. everything you made then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same down the other end too. End up doing the same mm -hmm. thing down there. Yeah. So this this catches water all along the bank all the way around and then that water slowly seeps back into the land here. Yeah, so slowly goes down and feeds all these guys down the hill. There's a tree in that tree guard there, they used to have to water all the time. And <laughs> and that's starting to put mulch around some of the trees around it because the trees I thought they were all getting moisture from it as well. And since I've put this in here, I don't need water at all. Mm -hmm. So I know it's working. Mm -hmm. That's the whole plan, not water, not to water at all. Mm -hmm. like the same as the same way I deal with these guys out here, these not natural trees, I want to deal with my garden. I don't want to have to touch them once they're in. Yeah. That's the plan. So I don't touch these, so why should I touch my garden really? Mm -hmm. Why should there be any special attention paid on my garden compared to God's garden? When you've got different properties, you're gonna to have to deal with different things differently too. This is all clay, but if you've got a sandy property, you're gonna to have to deal with things a little differently. Add lots more, more organic material into it as well, because mm -hmm. sand just filters water through really quickly. Whereas this is a clay, it's like, it's great, but it's, when it's hard, there's a saying, I think it was some garden book, and was it clay breaks your back and sand breaks your heart? Because uh -huh. <laughs> either way, you can't get a garden out of it, just a pack. Yeah. <laughs> so you didn't put any gypsum on there to break the clay down? Just no, relying on these the animals do things, the best yeah. thing. Yeah. A lot of things you can buy at the shops you don't really need, because just if you mm. can add bike to the soil, it mm. does everything yeah, for you. It's right. the workers. Yeah. So you can pretty much sit back and, well, not sit back, you've probably still got to do a fair bit of work yeah. to get it going first, but mm. yeah, after that, you can sit back and let it do all its work, mm. all the work you used to be doing, really. Human reliance way and God reliance. Yeah, like, exactly. we want to do it our way, and we think we have a way that's. That's what the garden good. shows tell you. The <laughs> sort of arrogant, yeah, but if we just try and align it back to God's system, like you're yeah, well, like showing you got, us. Like, well, like it, you guys have noticed up at the bunyas, you're just replicating what's going on up there. Just doing it here. It's going to take a little slow. And one thing that God is, is very patient. Mm -hmm. You just need to be patient too. Like I don't expect any of this to actually become a rainforest in my time here, but I know someone's going to benefit from it from later. Mm -hmm. If not, like at least the animals will benefit from it benefit pretty that. quickly. We were all given the opportunity to take part in a presentation project. The task laid out to us all was to create a short 10 minute presentation discussing whatever aspects of love we wanted to. We all got given the same six Bible quotations and each of us had to pick either two or three of these to focus our presentation upon. Jesus was sat in the audience during the duration of all of our talks and he was on hand to offer the gift of his feedback to help us all develop our presentation skills. Good morning everybody. Today I'm going to be speaking with you all about the importance of developing a personal relationship with God. Pain and suffering occurs when we act in disharmony with love and truth, how God knows it to be. And this is what is called sin. And as Jesus defined sin many times in the past, sin is where you are missing the mark of love in that particular area. We can connect with God or have a relationship with God at any moment in time. It doesn't matter where we are, we can be 35,000 feet up in a plane, we can be at the bottom of the ocean in a submarine, we can even be sitting on the toilet having a number two. <laughs> it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter, all that matters is you have a sincere desire in your heart to connect to God. So thanks everyone for listening. Cheers. You're worried too much about your audience right? and not and you're not focused enough on just the material and how much you love it. The the material and how much you love it comes across. Uh, you're enthusiastic with your enthusiasm. Mm. So if we maybe if I maybe look at your the way in which you did a presentation yep. first, um, your enthusiasm's good, um, your volume's good, and uh, your modulation of your voice is good. No, so you can it's easy to listen to. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest issue you have is with pausing. Um, yeah. you're so nervous, you're not giving yourself time even to breathe. Yeah. And so you, sometimes you even lost, I don't know if you noticed it, but you almost ran out of breath Yeah. and you didn't know what to do, whether yeah. to stop and take a big breath yeah. or what. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's a, that's a big issue for you to, yeah. to just let yourself relax a bit more and, and breathe. And one of the things, uh, that you learn when present with presentation mm -hmm. is that Pauses are sometimes far more effective than speaking. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah. So I feel in terms of the delivery, pausing is probably one of the yep. biggest things to examine. Many of you may in in misinterpret that verse. So you just got to be careful about the interpretation of a verse. Can you see, if you look at the verse, which is beloved, let us love one another for love is from God. And everyone loves is born of God and knows God. 
Mm. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, that verse I was referring specifically to the pr the fact that being born again means right. that if you are born again, you become born of God rather ah. than born of a mother, born of a human. Okay. So I, I use the term being born again specifically to indicate that one birth is the birth that you actually go through when you're actually born physically. Right. <laughs> right. And the other birth is the birth you go through when you're born spiritually. Right. And being born spiritually is about being born, le receiving some of God's love and that causes you to be born right. again. Right. And once you're born again, you, you love one another automatically and everyone who does not love, ah. it's proof that they are not born again. Right. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. They're not. Yeah. They're not born of God. They haven't been born again. Yeah. And and that's the point I was trying to make with that verse. And that, and it's a bit slight reference there in the in the verse that you quoted. But you can see if you relate it to other verses in John chapter three or two or three of the Bible, you'll see the relationship. It's not just that God desires we learn about love. That verse. Mm. That verse is about the fact that once we are born again or born of God we automatically know about love. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. automatically become right. loving as a result of it. Yeah. Yeah. On one of the environment days, we all got given such an awesome opportunity to go on essentially a tour around Jesus and Mary's property. During this tour, Jesus stopped off at various locations to explain to us what projects he's been up to and found good results in to help basically recover the land on his property itself. These are constructed quite, there's a great big hole in here and there's a great big log along here. We put a great big log along here. We put some, uh, you can see a bit of the Gravel. gravel underneath some rocks and some gravel underneath and then we put the hardwood on top of it and what happens is that if it is a really pouring rain you'll see a bit of water run off but most of the time it just soaks straight in yeah. seems like the hardwood's really decomposed really well. only because it's been driven over uh -huh. yeah, by the time. we've had probably probably close to 3,000 cubic meters this year just loaded <laughs> with the truck a lot. a lot of it came down this road, so that's why we've got to fix this up now. See those little birds there? <laughs> still there. <laughs> See, they've got babies. See the little tiny babies? They have to. They've got four of them. There's four of them from there. What are they called again? The, um, forgot. That's, that's as big as they get, hey? Oh, they're, they're, they're full grown, the big ones. They had four young this year. Jeez. So two, two, two lots of one, three, and one lot four. Huh. That's, that's, yeah. that's interesting because they're usually a very fragile species. Yeah. Give them. Chicken. You see how small the little fellas are. No, pretty big now. But when they first <laughs> out, they're just like, you know, oh. tiny. <laughs> <laughs> see all the seed of the reeds. Those reeds have seed pods that are this high, and there's probably 20, 30, 40 thousand seeds on one pod. <laughs> I should grab one for you and show you. But it just shows you, it just shows you if you want to get start, something started, mm. or the birds just bring in the seed on their feathers or whatever, and away it all goes, you know. Mm. Yeah. Now they'll drown if it fills up, obviously, but all that seed will all come up to the edge, and depending on how long the water stays. So the water was up to here, this fellow, and you see how low it is now. That's a lot of water, isn't it? Oh. The dam's probably five million cubic litres, five megalitre dam probably. So Jesus, is it lower there than here or is it? No, it just, it just, it just doesn't go over there. Yeah. Just, but we designed that there with rock across it, yep. just in case this can't handle the overflow, then it can so go over like there. So it's like a second overflow. Yeah. 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 The ground around it looks really, um, healthy well yeah this is, it must be a fair bit of moisture in it so we've got a few native species coming up along the edge now the ones that are high enough they'll survive if the dam falls up but the lower ones will probably die they're all actual big trees all right the others are wattle so they're recoveries but these are all big trees here and it's pretty interesting to see them what's happened is the seed must have come down 
in the water course when it filled up it would have filled up and the seed would have floated on the top and then the seed would have come down as the water dropped down and the seeds just now on the ground and then as a result it gets started and these will probably go real well because there's always going to be water here and even if it fills up by the time it empties enough it'll be just covering the roots of the plants mm. and so they shouldn't die those mm. ones shouldn't die yeah you can see though the the trees that are starting to grow up around the edge so mm. so they probably survive even if it gets really high because the water will low, slowly go down a bit and you can see there's different levels where there's different trees and different plants on the water's edge yeah, yeah. Mm. Cool. Cool. Yeah, now these holes uh, were dug out to fill the, to put the wall in. This is the dam wall here that we constructed. We constructed this dam, and um, and this wall had to be constructed. So we took stuff out of here and we took stuff out of the other side as well. And that's why we're filling up both sides with debosia to re recover the land. Mm. So in the end, these two places are like water bowls. We're going to be able to seed a lot of flowering calistamins and stuff and they will survive easily in there. So we're looking forward to getting them ready for that. And that's why we've been putting a lot of debosia in them. Yeah. What are flowering questions? Uh, like bottle brush, bottle brushes and everything. Oh. Uh, most of the birds in Australia are insect or flower or nectar eating. Okay. And, uh, and so we want to have places on the property where there's insects and flowers and stuff. Mm. And, yeah. yeah. So now when the water comes rushing off of there, it just goes straight in that hole and it doesn't go anywhere else. It just stays in that hole. And as a result of that, you can see these plants are now using the as a water source and see how there's all these seeds that now are coming off the plant. And and there's so much life in each of the plants, right? So so this is a good sign to see lots and lots of seed on a on a plant in a drought. Because we remember we had five years of drought and it's still seeding, right? So that, that's getting its any, any little bit of water that comes off the road and everything goes into this hole. And then this one's root systems have now got into the hole. Everything's working. Right. And it stops erosion going down there. And you can see now that erosion stops going down there. Plants will start recovering it and eventually plants will grow over the whole lot of it. And now there won't be any erosion once the plants are there. That's why you need the plants to stop the erosion. Yeah. I also see how thick this canopy is in this tree here, isn't it? It must be tapping into this hole compared to the other one. Exactly, there. yeah. It's a new tree and yeah. It's even seeding and flowering. You yeah, see all the flowers on the edge and yeah. pretty happy. It's happy. In a drought. Mm, it's heaps to see. In a drought. You look at other trees and you'll see that they're not seeding they're not flowering. Flowering and seeding takes energy mm -hmm. and so anything that hasn't got enough water and enough like yeah, mostly it's just water and nutrients won't, won't flower and seed. So it's a good sign when we see that happening in different places where we've recovered the land a bit. There's a big hole there and we fill it all up with the bosia what happens is the water comes down here, runs off of the side here into the hole and stays in the hole. But eventually we'll start seeing along this ridge wattle popping up and you see there's some wattle there, but no young ones yet. You see? So those wattle came up three or four years ago, five years ago. But since then we've got no young ones. But as soon as we get a rain, this will all, and then there'll be a slow dribbling of underground water down the ridge. It's very hard to recover ridges very hard why is that because everything's running off everything's running off it. Mm -hmm. so you want to keep stuff on it and the only way you can really keep stuff on it is by swaling it or hole putting holes in it and put matter in the hole mm -hmm. the only way you can keep stuff on it you know? and you and you've got to remember you're looking at it at the like after four or five years of drought mm -hmm. so it's the worst it's worst it's looked for a long time Still not as bad as when still not as bad as when we first came here. Yeah. So what we're doing with everywhere there's a bit of runoff, we try to put a hole down from it and put some matter in the hole so that they captures water. The beauty of doing that is you get things like the next hole, you can see there's a number of young wattle that are just surviving 
around the back of the hole. Oh yeah. And they they all came up as soon as we put the hole in and put matter in there. And they're just surviving, whereas they probably wouldn't be surviving if the hole wasn't there. Yeah. The same with the next hole, you can see the same yeah. things happen. Some of them are just starting to die now after five years of drought. So. But you notice if you look around that it's very hard to see a dead wattle. Even yeah. though we've had five years of drought. Now you can see again down that slope there's a bit of erosion. So we've got to fix up that slope. So which way would I run it? The slope? Down the gully. But I don't want it to go into the gully, do I? Where do I want it to go first? In the hole. Into the hole. So I aim the, the erosion controls so that the water will run into the holes. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it's another means of slowing down. Yeah. And keeping the water on the property too. Yeah. Yeah. You can see that callistum in there, that's a flowering bottle brush, the one that's right, the first one. That one there, um, we planted that one, but it is just like still, you can see it's flowering and, go, and still got new growth on it, even in a drought. Mm. So it was only this big, the same time the ones behind the house were that big. And wow. look at how this one's going. The soil here is a bit better because it's but you I can see the little bowl here. We're going to get you to dig up this hole later and look in it. But you can see here the grass green. <laughs> green grass in a drought, right? <laughs> Real weird, eh? And this is not the normal tufty grass uh, either, so it's a different type of grass. Real like after five five years normally well like i said there was no grass when i first came on the property at all here we come to the hardwood right this is the start of the hardwood why if we put it down stop erosion and holds the water what does it feel like to walk on no. it feels like a forest floor doesn't it yeah. that's <laughs> that yeah now it's been driven over a lot, so we want to repair it. That's what we're trying to do here. Right? How many years down for it to break down this much? Well, it's taken four years. With traffic. With traffic, yeah. With a lot of traffic, actually. And without traffic, it would be a lot longer. This is the hardwood that we're dumping. This meshes together right. and forms a really lovely layer. And then it's really interesting to see what happens when, when it rains because you get these huge mushroom patches, like, <laughs> like just eating away the hardwood. The smell of hardwood too when it rains. It's just amazing, yeah. yeah. Just That's so fine. nice. Yeah. And this is all offcuts from a wood mill yeah. that um, we get delivered. Well, we used to get it for nothing, but now it costs about 18 bucks a cube. Um, but it's still worth it. It's still worth it. Hardwood is better value than any other thing even at 20 bucks a cube. Why is that? Because it takes so long to decompose. So it benefits the ground for a much, much longer time. Mm. Much longer time. And you and you can see it starts out like this mm -hmm. and uh, looks all dry and flaky and whatever and just bits of wood. Meshes together real well so you can drive on it real nice. Mm -hmm. And if you have to, we don't like to, but you know sometimes we want to bring loads down here of different things. Doesn't bog up. Doesn't okay. bog up. Yeah. It stops erosion immediately because what happens is the rain falls and it just doesn't go anywhere, no matter how heavy the rainfall is. Wow. It just sometimes we come down here and the whole lot of it is just when you walk on it, it's like a sponge. You walk on it and all the water comes up. <laughs> you walk on it like and this is at the top of a ridge where you think all the water would run away. But because of the hardwood there, all the water just stays there and it's like walking on, on a sponge when you're after a rain. Mm. Okay? It's really good stuff. Just like what happens like if, when you went to the bunyas with all that leaf litter falling yeah. and yeah. twigs and stuff, it holds a lot of moisture then in the on. And it, it doesn't have to be thick, you know, a few, few inches thick in the end and amazing the benefit it does. Yeah. So we put this down pretty much anywhere where there's an erosion problem. There used to be big problems with the water coming down that hill, running down the road, and then running down the road and really eroding the next part of the road down and then dropping into a gully there. And since we put this down, 
we've had far less erosion all the way along and 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 also on each side of the on each side of it you get this grass now growing which wasn't growing mm -hmm. before because it keeps the water in as well mm. it's all about how much you can do on the top layer right mm. this shows how hardy these things are mm, on, like on the top of the roof and it's got seed pods. And it's got seed pods. Yeah. And it's yeah. flowered. And, and it's flowered. flowered. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but that the cool thing. never been watered. <laughs> never been watered. It was planted at one of those environment days. Yeah. Ago. Just planted yeah. in the wrong place. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, it's still growing. I love this place. <laughs> I just love being around here. Yeah, it's Turn into a rainforest, I reckon. Yeah, here, here's, here in like the learning centre, there's very similar starts. This is probably a bit worse than the learning centre, actually. A lot worse, yeah. A lot worse here. Lot worse here. And what we're going to do today is just spread some of it out. Because uh, it's not economical really doing it with the loader. Because what happens is they have to bring down the loader and go up with the loader and bring down the loader. You end up with more and more wear and tear and everything. So what, what, what I've actually found is you're better off just bringing down the truck, unloading the truck by driving it forward a little bit, and then uh, and then spreading it by hand. And I've spread, off my, by myself, I spread 600 cubic metres on the truck down there. And it only took me half a day or something like that. Maybe a whole whole day. Well, half a day in the sense that I started at five in the morning, so <laughs> finished about midday, you know. So it's not that hard to spread. The key when you're spreading it is you, you can see how the track goes. You can see you've got where the people are driving is compressed and where the centre is, centre ridges is free and the two sides are free. What you want is a mound where people are driving and a and flat everywhere else. Does that make sense? So that's what we're aiming for. So you know how last week we said with the Devosia even layer over everything, it's not like that. It's not like today. that here. It's more filling, make it even, or make it uh, sort of up where the tracks go. Where the so from the side would be like that, mound, flat, mound, yes. flat. Yeah, yeah. not like as big that. a mound as you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's, it's got to get driven base. over, so, you know, it's going to flatten It'll out. flatten it. It'll flatten out, yeah. Now, before I put this track in, there was no grass here at all down the side, oh, wow. interestingly enough. Oh. As soon as I put the grass, the track in, the grass has grown on both sides of the track, slowly, slowly more and more grass on both sides of the track. So it's obviously getting on, on the top end of the track, the top side of the track, the left hand side, it's because the, the track itself is like a moisture barrier, any water that, that falls in that area just stays there, right? And on the low side of the track, any moisture that falls in the track itself slowly goes down the hill. And that's why we're getting some growth. We've also put, you can see, debosia piles along the side to help that process of recovery. And this is where we saw some pretty big snakes. You can see that the water comes off the top of the tent, drops on the debosia, and everything further down gets watered. So look how healthy this is. It was getting eaten, that's why we put this around. But see how healthy he is? That's because he gets watered from the tent, naturally. And the debosia keeps the water there. You've got to be a bit careful putting hay down or something because you put hay down underneath it, it becomes so good soil that all the seed in the hay grows. <laughs> and we ended up a few years ago with a wall of grasses, <laughs> sorghum, 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 like 10 to 12 feet high <laughs> around the tent. It's really interesting what happens with plants, right? It's like you can see the ground on this side of it is like the ground that it was before. And then we've got layers and layers of debosia that have slowly decomposed on this side of it. The water sometimes drops here and look what's happened with the plant. He grows on the ground still, not in the debosia, but on the ground on the side of the debosia he's grown in. So some plants will grow in the debosia, no worries. Other plants seem to just like it on the edge of it. And off he goes and he's a lamandra and look at how he's gone. He's even seeding, look at that. Oh, no, that's, a, that's not a seed. The seeds come from the uh, centre of these. There it is. There's the seed there. So he's even seeding in a drought. Like I said, 
anything seeding in a drought means that when there's no drought, it should be pretty good. Oh. This is the normal ground. Huh? Hard as a rock. Yeah, pretty hard to dig into that. Look at this thing. That's growing in that. It's got new growth and it's a still in a drought. New growth. Seeds, it's gonna flower soon. Mm. Alright. Is that another bottle brush? Yeah. Hardy ears, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Man, you look at what they're growing in, it's like you dig this up. You know, I've hit the ground. <laughs> that that there. This is one of its roots, of course. What it's done is because it's got that debosia layer over the top that's now turned into soil, it shins its roots right out, getting as much moisture as it can. Some water drips off the tent occasionally. Here we're trying to recover things on the top of a ridge. The way you recover things on the top of a ridge is by putting down a lot of matter on the top of the ridge, but it's a lot more work than recovering right down the bottom would be. Does that make sense? All the water's going down there. So recovering down there is going to be a lot easier than recovering up here. So why, why are you d doing that? Well, what the theory I've got is that if you if you let the base do its normal work and you start at the top, the two are going to meet much more rapidly mm. than if you just let the base do its work and slowly work its way up the hill. It's interesting when you go to somewhere like New Zealand where they've done a huge amount of clearing, right, particularly South Island, you can see all the water courses are in recovery, yeah. right, where they're starting to recover. But because of farming, you know, yeah. cattle, sheep farming, the, they can't go any higher up the ridge yeah. and so the ridges are bare and everything's bare up top but if you start up top and at the bottom and you stop the farming yeah. now the two have got much more chance to rapidly join together you want what we want between here and there is grass yeah. so mm -hmm. yeah. at least grass because okay. otherwise there's erosion you just got to be clever with the way water you know the way it is with water don't you yeah. Yeah. yeah, you've got to kind of understand water. And you've got to understand yeah. plants a bit too. Yeah. Remember the grasses, the more and more grasses we get, the more there is, the more the grasses when they die off will be dropping matter onto that ground. And the more grass there is, it creates like a mesh where if there's heavy rain, even if it's on a big hill, the erosion won't eat out the grass and make all the seed go away. You want all that seed staying where it is. Yeah. So, you know, you want all that to happen, don't you? So, you know, that's why you really, you really got to think about you're doing it slow. You know, you try, you know, you could come up here and go, okay, what I'm going to do is make a garden out of this and I'm going to pour all this resource into that and, and try to get some stuff growing and honestly getting it growing in a natural way without having to water it, yeah. impossible. Mm. So that's just like a facade. Dealing with a facade or dealing with the emotion. Yeah, yep. same thing then. And this helps you confront the emotion that created the issue in the first place. Which is an impatient. Mm -hmm. Immediate gratification result. feeling mm. of humanity. And this means yeah. that you don't get immediate gratification. You have to be patient. Yeah. My name's David. I come from Barbados and I'm a volunteer. Uh, my name is Courtney and I'm from the USA and I'm a volunteer. My name is Nikki. I'm from London, England, and I'm a volunteer. In the volunteer project, um, I've been learning just how much damage and how easy it is to hurt the environment. Um, I've been learning how to try to work hard, have an actual work ethic, and not just have others work for me. Um, I've been learning some technical skills, um, some things I never even considered about sound that were pretty cool. Um, I've been learning how to look at my resources better. Um, I have to consider electricity. I have to consider the water. I have to consider my environment more here. I can't just let things go. I've definitely learned a lot emotionally um, about myself and about um, how I learn, about being in service, about um, 
yeah, my own personal emotions and responses to situations and people, software, um, cameras, studio setup, switching, um, video editing, sound editing, about the environment, eco projects, how to restore the environment, um, waterless gardens, like so much stuff. Um, it's been action packed and I sort of feel like I'm back in university a bit, which is amazing because there's just been so much to learn. Learning how much work goes into the whole divine truth uh, production, really. Um, learning about how things all work behind the scenes and coming to appreciate all the things that do go into it and all the time that people such as Jesus and Lena and Igor um, spend, really. Um, you know, it, it's not just at the group or at an event. Uh, where all the time goes in and the prep before that, there's a lot of work after it. And I never knew how much work actually went into it. So for me, that has been a real eye-opening thing. Learned how to not use the computer so much. I learned how to, to, to actively not want to be in addiction with other people, specifically that are my age, um, women and men. I learned to cook. Learned a lot of things about cooking here. Um, really good. I'm gonna definitely take those back home. <laughs> a lot more about myself and and what kinds of uh, emotions I need to keep working through, basically, to to help divine truth more. When I've been here, uh, a lot of my own injuries and addictions have been confronted, and I've been pretty resistive to it, really. Um, so that's been a big eye-opening thing for me, and realizing that I'm not as humble as I thought I was before. I'd say the most challenging thing, that first shift, that first shift, like going from a place of, I don't want to do this. And um, I'm pretty comfortable in my little space to deciding, you know what, let's do something different. Um, and really making some kind of effort to actually do something different, not just talk about it. The physical labor, um, sometimes was, was difficult, uh, just because I'm not accustomed to it as much. Um, and it would bring up some stickier emotions. Um, but I'd say, I'd say most of the difficulty came in when I had resistance around different things that were raised with me. And just learning to, to see the feedback as a gift rather than a personal attack or or some kind of version of me falling down. Facing fears for me has been the most challenging thing. And that's not to say that I've really faced that many of them. Um, but, but coming to terms with some of the fears has been challenging. Um, allowing myself to be myself has been challenging. Um, and, and that's, yeah, that's probably been the most challenging thing for me as well as some of the, um, self-imposed challenges that I've created with different emotions I have related to to learning things as well um so yeah it's 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 but it's always been challenging in a good way in a way of like learning more about myself and learning more about my resistances and, and that's going to help me to grow long term as a lot of you probably know Australia is known for having a lot of dangerous animals and Within the first week of being here, uh, I came across a redback spider, so black widow. Uh, obviously, they're pretty, pretty dangerous if, if you get bit by them. And also in the first week here, I, uh, a black taipan snake uh, crawled up behind me when I wasn't looking. I had this feeling that, you know, all these animals were out to get me because of my fear. Um, but I've actually found that the spiders, they keep themselves to themselves generally. And also the snakes, the snakes want to get away from you, to be honest, as quickly as possible. They don't really like hanging around. I felt I kind of knew more technical stuff in terms of computer stuff than I actually did know. And so I had quite a, I was quite like a block to learning. Um, so that obviously prevented me from absorbing and learning as much information as I probably would have wanted to in the end. 
I would recommend that people take some of the feedback that they get and really drive some self-reflection themselves. Um, you're going to learn a lot of principles here that you probably have never really felt before. And when you do, you can really take that opportunity to investigate it for yourself. And I think that's a, a big part of a takeaway from this trip, is self-responsibility. Have an open heart. Um, be prepared for the unexpected. Because it's not going to be what you expect. Unless you've got a really keen sense of understanding. There's going to be a lot of things that come up that you're just not, that you don't think you're prepared for. But if you can go through it, then you'll, you'll, you'll expand or grow. I think the biggest thing I'd have to say to, to anyone is, is just to focus on desire. And to just allow the feedback that you get. Because you're, you're around people that are so loving. And there are not many chances in life where you can be around people that just give you those gifts. And just figuring out a way emotionally to accept those gifts without putting up that wall. And have fun. If you can. <laughs> while, you're, while you're crying. <laughs> it's important to really feel through whether sharing divine truth is what you want to really do with your life. So it's really important to come with as clear of a vision as you can about what you, what you want to do. Because um, the training is really about helping us share divine truth more or, or better. And so, um, so it's really like meant for that purpose. This is something I've been learning because I've had issues with this as well, is that it's about being of service rather than being served. Um, because in the end, this training opportunity, the volunteer opportunity, is really a massive gift to those of us that come. Um, and it's a gift that Jesus and Mary are offering and a lot of other people here, the directors of the Learning Center, Lena and Igor, people who are training, um, all of us, it's a really big gift of their time and resources and energy. It really all does work on desire and that was something that I didn't really understand when I first came and now I'm starting to learn towards the end. Um, so I would say, you know, just like really engage the law of desire and act on your desires and experiment with the desires, little things, big things. Don't miss any of the opportunities. Um, and I, I have missed some opportunities based on different fears and different things that I missed um, that I didn't see that I was doing or not doing. And so as much as you can, just take every opportunity that is given, every opportunity that happens in situations, um, opportunities to connect with people, opportunities to work through stuff with other people, opportunities to learn, to help, to, to be of service. Um, yeah, just take take as many opportunities as you can. You, you wanna have as little regret when you leave as possible. Feel about your desire in terms of whether you want to gift uh, to the people here or what it is, or the reason why you're doing it is because you wanna actually get a whole heap of things in return. It's important to kind of come along with an open heart you know, not feel like you know a lot of things that you usually probably won't know. Um, you know, just see it as as a gift and you know a, a big learning experience and a, and a chance to give back to the people or to a lot of people who have been giving everyone else gifts for a long time. I'm really happy that I put my life on pause and came here um, because it's just it's, it's derailed everything. It's given me a different perspective. Um, it's just, it's really opened my horizons a lot more. Coming here has, has taught me some, some skills that I'll use for the rest of my life. So, absolutely, I would do it again. I would definitely do all of this again. Um, but the next time, I'd like to do it with more of an open heart, to be honest. Um, I've realized I missed a lot of opportunities here. If the opportunity ever came about again, I'd love to come back and just see it with a completely different mindset and and engage it with a real open heart way more so than I did this time around. We'd do it again and again and again and again. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, for me, it's been the best experience of my life by far. 
um, the best thing I've ever done, the biggest opportunity I've ever had, the, the biggest gift I've ever received. Um, and so I'm really, really grateful. We would like to thank everybody um, for this opportunity and for inviting us all out here to take part in this volunteer project. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, firstly Jesus and Mary Madeline for their guidance and wisdom and expertise in helping us all learn more about love. Tris, Ello, Pete, Catherine, Lena, Igor. I'd like to thank Corny. I'd like to thank Wayne for those pro tips on the loader. So yeah, we'd just like to thank all of these people that we've mentioned just for making us stay really pleasant and enjoyable. And it's been really nice to get to know everyone a little bit. And yeah, just like to thank everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Great opportunity. See ya. Desire to give. If, if <laughs> hey. <laughs> We've had the first full day in the learning center, me and Dave. And as you can <laughs> These ah. flies though. <laughs> Hello Nikki. Hello. I see you there videotaping. <laughs> Walks in like a bit of a ninja. Okay, it's good, but it's very dry. Mm. Oh, hell. Sorry. <laughs> it's good. I'm really having a hard time keeping eye contact. Uh, it's like, woo! Like, oh, I just released fear. All right, guys, we're going off script now. He's like, three times bigger than your head. It looks like my arm's like eight feet long. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that, Queensland? <laughs> Last it doesn't work. <laughs> it does not seem slow. You know what? Because he enunciates it. He goes, London, England. Home of the poisonous snakes. <laughs> you gotta be like, you should be afraid of us. Ozzy, Ozzy, Ozzy. Oi, oi, oi. Well, there you go. That's like really thuggish and I don't like it. It's <laughs> thuggish. My name's David. I come from Barbados. And I'm. <laughs> It sounds like an ad every time I do it. <laughs> I'm 30 oh, and I like Yeah, right? I like sunsets. <laughs> Alright, I can't. I can't. <laughs> it's not natural. Okay. <sighs> I can do this. I'm laughing. <laughs> Lena, Igor. That, mo that moment when you pause. <laughs> <laughs> triple, from triple, triple treat. treat. The triple treat. Can I get my camera and we can take a selfie? Zoom a thing? Yes. Oh, there's no zoom. No. Zoom is not a thing. No. I'm the zoom. You're the zoom. Yay. Oh. Uh, hey, <laughs> Pictures are just f moral. <laughs> and this whole thing's recording. We're just out of control. <laughs> well, you know, I wasn't really used to like living in like the wild. I'm like kind of a city girl. Um, but the wallabies are cute. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I quit. I quit. <laughs>